Okay, hi everyone. Um, today we're going to dissect and explore the crucial role of community in Web3. We have a fantastic panel here um, offering insights from a legal perspective, NFT, community building perspective, marketing and content creation perspective. Um, so a lot of different uh, areas of expertise. So you can expect to know uh, bullshit, all insight session. Um, but first off, let's introduce ourselves, I think. Um, I'll start with myself because I'm moderating this, this panel. I'm Robin, um, I run a Web3 marketing agency. What we do is helping early stage projects uh, growing their social presence and building community. We also help them with exposure activities like influencer, token launch strategies, KOLs, or however you want to, want to call it. Um, the name Altcoin Edge is kind of interesting for an agency. We didn't start off that way. We started off as a YouTube channel. And um, um, while we were kind of YouTube content creators, we were building a community around our audience. And that's how we kind of um, got to know how important a vibrant community can be and how powerful. Um, but not only that, we, we learned the ins and outs of effective community building. Um, and then we realized that there are a lot of projects in the space that actually really want to build a community, but not always have the, uh, the capacity in house or the expertise, and, and that's where we come in. Um, so I hand it over to Engie. Cool, um, I'm Ingi. Um, I am the Chief Content Officer at Doodles. Um, before joining Doodles, I uh, ran an animation studio for 10 years called Golden Wolf. Um, and that studio was acquired in April by Doodles. Um, and since then, I've been working on like, any kind of anima animated content or design content coming out of Doodles. And I'm tasked with kind of creating the lore around the characters and like, building a world around, around what Doodles is and um, essentially like, entertaining people. Great. Hi. Uh, hello, I'm Anne. Um, I'm. Uh, <laughs> hello. Okay, it oh. works. Um, I'm Anne. I'm a fiction author, a podcaster, and a marketing professional who's been working in this space since 2017. Hi, Mila. I'm Mila. <laughs> Mila Lolly, uh, founder of NFT UK. Um, I founded it in 2021, and since then I've been growing it and trying to educate as much as I can people in the Web3 space. I'm also the founder of Crew, which is a job platform um, that authenticates experience. Hi everyone, I'm Omri. I'm a fail creative turned lawyer. And uh, I work in the space in the Web3 space, so I help projects from you know IP, financial services, gambling, and uh, yeah, the main focus is Web3. So <clears throat> I've been working for a few years, and uh, very excited to speak about community, which um, I guess we all think is the most important aspect uh, within the space. So thanks a lot for being here for this talk. Cool. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of different areas that we can cover. Um, just to kick off. Um, I want to focus a little bit on community engagement in relationship to uh, content or, or art. Uh, Inji, with your experience at Doodles, um, how do you think uh, design content and art has amplified community engagement? Um, I mean, given that it's my job, I'd say there's done a, done loads of really good stuff. Um, um, but I mean, Doodles is a is a is a PFP project, um, where it's like a, you know, an art project, really, um, based on the art of, of um, an artist called Burnt Toast. Um, so really, from, from our perspective, you know, the art itself, or like, you know, the art that we put out, like alongside the, the NFTs themselves, you know, is the, you know, is the thing that drives our community. You know, like the community obviously comes into NFTs for different reasons. You know, some people are there for the, for the art, some people are there to belong to something, some people are there for, for financial gain. Um, but the art's the thing that drives everything. Um, obviously, during the you know the bull market and, and maybe the start of the bear, like I think a lot of projects were very focused on on hype, you know, and kind of you know 
things that would drive the floor price or like get people interested or you know get the followers. Um, but the difficult thing about that is that they don't deliver. Then obviously, like you know, well, if they overhype something, then like there's 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 a big risk that they're going to fail or that their communities, you know, aren't going to be happy with it. Or you know, it's, it's difficult to keep them engaged with that kind of stuff. So, content, you know, from from our perspective, is about kind of keeping the the uh, attention of the community. Um, which at the end of the day, NFTs are all about attention, right? You know, like. The more people that know about Bitcoin, the higher the price is, you know, and I think it's kind of the same for, for all of Web3. So um, the more we can do to keep people's attention, the more we can do to keep people entertained, um, you know, the, the, the better the project is and, and the, the better the community is. Um, on the flip side of that, there's community art, which has been like a really, really big part of, of what we do and what the community does. Um, you know, we've got some amazing artists in, in, in the community, um, you know, making you know, like almost like fan fiction, fan art, like based on the on the stuff that we do. But also like, you know, that element like really helps like strengthen the community and make people feel like they're like they're part of something. Um, but essentially like what we're trying to create, um, you know, with the project, with the company is um, we're working within a model called transmedia, which essentially means telling a story through as many different mediums as possible. Um, it's so like Star Wars is a really good example of transmedia. Like there's games, there's movies, there's TV shows. Like it all, all kind of breaks out into like lots of different things. Um, and where the community comes in, where transmedia excels, is where you leave as many gaps as possible and kind of allow the community to fill those gaps. So, you know, we're we're starting to tell stories now. You know, we're we're working on some like long form content, and the idea being that you know there's going to be these stories with different characters and, and within our world, and we're going to build the tools for the community to be able to tell sort of the gaps between the between the stories that we tell so that not only are they being entertained by the, the stuff that we're doing they truly feel like they're being part of the story yeah i, I love that um i actually have seen people rocking their doodles uh, uh pfps on, on 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 twitter but also they're creating all kinds of you know different art versions i would call it of their, their NFT and, and using that like as a GM or you know to, to, to express themselves in another way. So that is kind of what you, what you mean with filling the gaps where, where kind of the, the user can exp use the, 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 the creatives to, to express themselves. Is that, is that right? Yeah, to a degree. So, so um, I mean, essentially, as it is right now, and I think it's kind of the same for a lot of PFP projects, is that there isn't like a huge amount of law. Well, there isn't a huge amount of like story that's already been put out there. Um, so what we're working on now is, you know, essentially building the world out. We've got two main characters, Happ and Mello, like a boy and his cat, um, and we're creating like a like a sort of longer form content with those characters. Um, and then we're gonna do the same with like other characters throughout the collection. Um, and so, you know, essentially, what the stories do, like kind of versus what's going on now, which is like you know, designing something, you know, putting your, your PFP in something, you know, writing GM next to it. That's filling a gap from like a, from like a belonging perspective, but there, there isn't like a story that ties, ties into it. You know, like if you were a huge fan of Star Wars and you, you know, you created your own character, there was a Star Wars character, you'd know where that character belongs within the story. And so that's kind of, that's what we're working towards. So it's more, more than just the kind of, I was here during the bull run, I minted this, you know, I belong in, within this community, but also like, here's my character and it lives alongside these other characters that everyone knows. Yeah, and this is what it kind of means and this mm. is the background. So you're creating the background of things, basically, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay, cool, that sounds very cool. Um, to, to stay in this creative uh, area, Mila, how do you think, you know, you're, you're, you're founder of NFT UK and I've, I've been to that, uh, uh, to the events that you run a, f a few times um, and it's in real life so you've been able to bring online communities to the real life and, and let them connect to each other how how do you think those interactions have kind of shaped these communities yeah um, well from my perspective um, you know it's good to have a community where you can be in a group and chat online that's fine and it's fun but I guess after COVID and after the pandemic, I started to feel quite isolated. 
Uh, so that's why I kind of funded it because I wanted to have people IRL that can meet, uh, that can build trust, even though we live in a world that is, um, well, that is kind of systematically trustless, uh, the whole like system. But I thought I wanted to create a hub of people that want to come together, exchange ideas, meet face to face and, you know, share knowledge and educate each other um, and also share their experiences. And since then, since 2021, uh, we've been hosting monthly events with the pure goal to onboard as many as we can. And in fact, we have doodles there, we have board days, we have every PFP that you can imagine. They all come together and, you know, they, they become part of this movement. And they also find, you know, their friends, they find their coworkers. It's, it's, a, it's a really beautiful hub to go and, um, and kind of connect with others. Um, and it's very cultural, it's very open-minded. So I thought IRL experiences are very valid and they're very important to the world out there that does, doesn't know what really NFTs and Web3 is about. And we have continuously um, newbies, I would call them, or people that are very curious to learn what the space is about. And we've created a very welcoming and safe place. Uh, it's not pretentious. It's just um, a hub of culture, growth, education, and so on. So yeah, it's it's been very important for the last two years. And then I've also seen a lot of other groups doing their own communities and so on, um, because there's only much you can do online. Um, you know, you, you will talk to someone, you, you'll see their PFP, but that human interaction is is something that is quite priceless. Um, yeah, yeah I, I agree. I can confirm that it's very welcoming because I remember the first time I went um, to NFT UK, I was actually going to go with a friend and he cancelled last minute and I decided to just go by myself. And within a few minutes, I was just chatting to random people, making new friends, you know, all the conversations were not awkward because we all had like common interests and stuff. And then when you go to other events in Web3, you see the faces and you're like, oh yeah, I know this, this person goes to the NFT UK events and, and you know, it's, so it creates this... Um, Trust. Yeah, trust and possibility of connecting. And, and you know, yeah, yeah, I think trust is a very good word because online you don't trust anything. You don't even know if the person is there, right? 100%. So, I mean, you've yeah. seen so many stories where people have been talking to each other for like months or years and they only know each other's PFP and then things didn't go very well at the end. Maybe they started collaborating and this, there's just really nothing that ties each other in on a human level. So... Yeah, I'm, I'm a big advocate for IRL, and exactly you guys are here on an IRL, exp uh, you know, ex uh, oops, sorry, <laughs> experience. Yeah, yeah. My I just came back from Italy, so I'm switching on to my English. <laughs> yeah. yeah, loving it. Um, Ani, about marketing and, uh, and community engagement, how, how does community engagement uniquely drive marketing efforts, you think, and uh, brand development? when it comes to Web3 brands compared to Web2? Yeah, I, I will probably start with um, what's done wrong and then shift into <laughs> what's supposed to be done because it feels like community has been an uh, um, overused and misused word in, in this space, especially by marketers. And, uh, and everyone tells that the community is very important, but like, you know, how they actually deal with the community doesn't really show what they are saying. So very often, um, unfortunately, there are loads of projects that uh, approach their marketing and community building from a perspective of, um, they are creating a community of people who want to get rich quick. Because what they do is, uh, you know, it's always very easy to to have this common Web3 narrative of kind of, you know, you're going to make money really fast. And as a result, they end up with communities of speculators who came for the money. As a result, what happens is when the bear market comes, they leave you because they came for the money and there is no money anymore. They didn't come for you or for your project or what you're building for. Um, and also the way marketing approaches very often because they are pushed by the founders is um, chasing the numbers but chasing the wrong numbers. They're chasing the numbers of how many people are in their Discord servers, but just you know, putting thousands of people in one Discord server and putting a moat to talk to them doesn't really make it a community. So I think what people need to remember and in terms of marketing is that 
beyond, beyond these numbers, there are human living, breathing people. And you know, unless you do real life events, you won't really know that. But that's you you may, you know, start forgetting about it and chase those numbers, but there are real people behind it. So I think oh, obviously everyone uh, you know, I, I would be super happy if everyone made tons of money in this space, but I think each project should be about something else beyond money. And that something else should be the thing that unites people because people want to feel a belong belonging and you know they want to belong somewhere they want to meet like-minded people and they want to unite around a certain purpose so when you build a community by manifesting what you are about what's the purpose what is that main why of what you are building and people come for that that's when the real communities start building because they come for something more than just the money and they're gonna stick around with you and the community building is basically in marketing when you do that it it is relationship building. It is about actually, you know, not leaving it to the mod, but the whole team, the whole project being there, talking to people, you know, monitoring the, the dialogues, getting insight in terms of what they actually care about, what do they want, how they feel about the project, and also involving them. Because I feel like the community engagement is about having that community being part of your journey. You share that journey with them, you take them with that journey, you know, with you, and, and they start contributing to it. You know, there are tons of things that maybe you haven't figured out yet. Just make a dialogue with them. Take, you know, give them the opportunity to, to be part of the decision making. Build it together. And later on, like, you know, it will be, the community will be the willing part of your marketing. You won't even need to spend so much budget on paid stuff because the community who actually cares about you will be out there talking about your project because they care about what you really do. So NFT, you know, NFT UK meetups, like tons of people, including me, go around and talk about those meetups and invite people to go with them because we genuinely believe it's a really nice initiative and we really enjoy it. That's what the community is about, not just paid ads, you know, giving tons of money to influencer, to shill a coin or anything else. So, um, so I feel like, you know, we need to shift and flip the mindset and think about marketing and community building from you know, at a more core and fundamental perspective, rather than just, you know, how many people do you have in Discord servers? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I I actually spoke to, so there's, there's, there's someone in our community um, that was a moderator in, in one of the projects that we did some marketing services for. And I, I was catching up with this, uh, this guy because he became lead community manager in that project. And I was like, oh, you know, now with the bear market, it's probably quite that in your in your community. And he actually said something very interesting. He said, like, well, to be honest, it's actually a bit of a relief that a lot of the moon boys are gone. And now I have real conversations with the community that's left. And they're really contributing towards the project because obviously the project is, is building. They're, they're creating all these kind of great features that actually a lot of people that were initially there that just came from for speculation, they even are not aware of it. They don't even know how this project is further evolving. But the guys that stayed during during the bear cycle, I think you know there's a lot that they can gain. So in, it's very ironic because in the end of the day, maybe the guys that stayed in the community will get more out of it than the guys that just came there because price went up for a while. And I think that's super, um, super interesting, but also is something for projects to, to, to keep in mind that you don't lose motivation in, in the bear market, but look into what's left in the community, find those community, core community members or fans and, and see, you know, how they are contributing to, uh, to your project and, and make sure to to look after them, I think, because these, I think these members are the most valuable ones that you can have. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's interesting that you mentioned sort of you know the product building itself because I know many founders who ended up building the product for themselves that only they were excited about, and then when the user acquisition phase came in, they ended up realizing that no one really needs it. Um, so, so while building the product, when you build it together with the community, you first of all make sure that you know uh, people actually need it and want it. 
uh, and they are excited enough during this journey that by the time it comes out, they are impatiently working to jump on it. Also, when you are building it together, they will be your beta testers, they will provide you feedback, they will give you suggestions. So eventually, you know, they will be part of the builders, uh, builders team as well, and they will feel this ownership and belonging to the whole thing. So they will be emotionally connected to it. And you will make sure like that, that you know, you are building something that actually people need and not just something you yourself are interested in. Yeah, and, and that building together with the community, I think is something you see in Web3, but you actually do not see that in Web2, really. Like in Web2, it's, it's very one directional, where it's product founders, this, you know, here's a new feature. No one asked for it, <laughs> but there's a new feature, right? And in Web3, the community really can decide and give feedback. Like the weight of the communities is just way bigger than the weight of the consumer in, in, in Web2, I think. Um, on this topic, marketing and community en engagement, Omri, you, you're a Web3 lawyer, you're here on the panel um, talking about community, so it would be nice to hear how relevant community is to your day-to-day -day and, and also you know, what to be mindful of when it comes to the re regulatory frameworks and, and the legal aspect of community building. <clears throat> yeah, so. It's probably unusual for you know most clients, especially Web2 clients that approach the Web3 or blockchain space and want to uh, build products uh, revolving around or including blockchain and crypto assets. For you know, it's, it's unusual for the, to them you know to come to a lawyer and the lawyer is saying, "Well, you know, have you built community?" Like, and the reason we are saying that is because you can build the best product, the best service, but if no one is aware of it, then you're not going to sell anything. It's not going to be successful. And it has happened to so many projects, both on the uh, you know more art uh, side of the spectrum to the more, let's say, uh, traditional sort of e-commerce side. And, and the reason is that the Web3 community is still very uh, small. And you need to find you know, your community within that small pocket out there. So um, as I mentioned, sadly, you know, if you, I've seen a few, a few projects that I thought were really great in terms of product. Uh, but just completely failing and neglecting community, trying to rely on traditional marketing. And traditional marketing, in my experience, doesn't work. Also, we're here talking about community. We're not here talking about consumers. And there is quite a difference. And that's why, and I'm saying that because I think there are two aspects that come to mind that I think are really important when we're talking, when we're considering a building a Web3 community. One aspect of it is incentives. And like Annie said, you know, and I completely stand by that, Financial incentives, I don't think they work particularly well. They might bring some virality at the beginning, especially when the market conditions are right. But after that, if the tokenomics don't work, and I've not yet seen any tokenomics model really being effective, then you're left with nothing. And uh, what type of incentive can you go towards? Well, for example, like um, like Inge was saying, story, you know, building narrative into the IP, that could be an effective way of doing it. I think it's hard. Another another aspect that I love, particularly being a crypto punk, is to create something that is meaningful from a cultural perspective. For example, crypto punks, and then facilitating the community in building their own stories. So what I love about crypto punks is that those uh, assets. It's also a profile picture project, so a PFP, but it's in the the level of goodwill that the holders have injected into their own, you know, characters, like representing them online is incredible. And I, I feel that the community is building its story day by day. And now, in, and you know, I think Yuga Lab, since they uh, purchased, you know, CryptoPunks, have done a great job in supporting the, the, the community in building this narrative. And it can be, you know, through different type of initiatives from branches, which are great. I know it sounds so obvious, but it's been super effective to, to, other, to other aspects. And the second aspect, I would say, is scale. So the problem is that like we said, when you you can when you scale too quickly, or if the numbers are too large, you know, going back to what numbers are you focusing on, I think it's the more your community grows, the harder it is to actually keep that feeling of community alive, especially online, because uh, people can be you know more shy than others, so you end up basically with the same ten people just bombarding Discord, and I hate Discord by the way, but and and so I think it's important also to understand based on your project what is the right number in which you know, people can still interact and feel they belong and feel that they are getting to know other people uh, on the online side. And then, of course, uh, real-life events, I think, uh, can't really be su uh, substituted. 
So in terms of like regulation, just to, to bring that in uh, and to answer your questions, I would say um, now, especially in the UK, there is now in uh, three days, two days. Um, there Way is, uh, too fast. What? <laughs> Way too quick. Way too quick. Well, so, some say it's too late already. But, but the, um, so there is a new regulation that is coming up. Uh, effectively, it extends the financial promotion regime. Doesn't mean anything. Basically, if you market, uh, crypto or uh, NFTs are outside, but it goes deeper than that. So please, just because you label something as NFT, it doesn't mean that you're completely outside, you know, and don't have to consider this particular piece of regulation. But what I'm saying is that if you try to incentivize community growth and the adoption of your products and services by, especially through financial incentives, be very, very careful. And that's again why not only from a, let's say, success rate standpoint, from a sort of cultural perspective, but also from a regulatory perspective, projects should really focus on different type of incentives that are not financial, in my opinion. But of course, that doesn't work for everything. We're talking about Web3, so I'm talking more on the crypto adoption or blockchain adoption within the creative industries, where different type of incentives work. If you're dealing with a pure financial product, probably you're already aware of all of this side of regulation, or at least you should be, and, and you'd be compliant, but there are certain rules that apply. So yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's definitely an area to follow. Like, not even if you're a project or you know an exchange, but I, I think also from um, the the user uh, perspective, because I think you know users might have to be careful as well what they're kind of promoting and stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, as a, if you are participating to a Discord, you know, even if you are not the mod and you start shilling, you know random coins and all of that, well, then you'd be captured by the scope and you shouldn't really be doing that because otherwise it's an infringement. So, but yeah, wh what I would say is that if you are a Web2 company that is considering entering into the space, before you even try to build a product or a service or build a community, try to first participate in one to understand how it works within the space, to understand what the dynamics are like. And then once you, you know, once you participate and let's say you still decide to go ahead with it, then try to understand what is your community going to be about. Because large brands, I think, like, you know, Nike, I mean, they purchased Artifact, but, um, which is a very uh, native and well-known project in the space. But if you look at also more established brand in Web2, I think Web3 gives the opportunity to be, um, to bring in a more localized approach to uh, community building for these brands. So instead of doing the things that are global, try to be more, try to implement initiatives that are more localized, try to promote and facilitate the gathering of people that are really resonating with what your brand is doing. So for Nike, it could be around, I don't know, Jordans, uh, like a drop. Instead of just having a drop in the shop where people kill each other to get the shoes, try maybe to cultivate the culture. And I think that commercial success is normally the result of making the right choices throughout the journey. And if you promote culture, then people will resonate with your product and we want to collect it and we want to buy it and we want to have it, you know? So I think, I, I really don't think you can go wrong if you focus on, on the more cultural aspect uh, of your brand, if you're a Web2 project. If you're a native project to Web3, then I think try not to adopt the typical blueprint of, okay, here is my collection, this is the roadmap, we're gonna build a metaverse. I mean, now there is less of that because of the bear market, but towards the end of the bull market, it was basically a copy-paste. All the projects were the same. And I mean, what, you know, what do we as participants expect? You know, like, it's clearly the only incentive that you have is financial because it's all the same. Yeah, copy-paste doesn't work in the bear market. Like in the bear market, it's about differentiation. And like, in the, in the, yeah, when price goes up, copy-paste tends to work because everyone wants the new, the new one that goes up and they don't care about what it actually is. And just to add to that, then I'll promise I'll shut up. But like, I also think it's important to understand, does it make sense to integrate uh, you know, cryptographic assets or blockchain technology within your offering or within the life of your business? It might not. You, know, you might have to wait and see. I was speaking the other day with someone that uh, runs uh, you know, charitable efforts, and they were saying that they wanted to launch a token. Launching a token can be an absolute nightmare when it comes to regulation, especially if you want to do it from the UK. And I didn't really see the purpose of it. What's the point of me 
buying a token and then donating the token to you when actually blockchain can be used to address the massive problem within the uh, you know charitable world which is trust or lack of trust because then you can use the you can use you know um, blockchain technology to track where the donations are going to to introduce trust in a system that is lacking trust at the moment and that can be beneficial so that's also why I try to discourage blueprint sort of copy and paste uh, approaches because your business may already be facing a problem that can be solved through the right type of adoption. So don't just think, you know, I need to issue a token or a DAO, you know, and, and so on and so forth, just because that's what you hear. So Yeah, I, I agree with you. It needs to be more purpose-driven than uh, trend hopping, right? Um, cool. I don't know if there's time for some questions. We'll give you one question, folks. Okay. So you've got to be succinct in your answer. Who wants to ask the question first? Got a question first hand. You guys have been so good that they're mesmerised <laughs> into silence. Not just, hang on, one question. We've got one question here. What's your What's your question about? <laughs> you tell me. I'll scream it out. This is a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> something about hollow chain, something about trust and security. <laughs> <laughs> Can you guarantee it? I did, yeah. Trust and security. How do we guarantee it, folks? <laughs> what guarantee what? <laughs> it hurts scale and security. Try with would it would be a fair thing? He did mention hollow chain, I don't know what that is. It's oh, so you're selling your project. Thank you. It's obviously a chain and it's hollow. Um, <laughs> something about trust and security. Can you guarantee trust? How do people, why would people trust you in what you're doing? Uh. Giza. <laughs> They shouldn't. Sorry, my friend. It was way, too, way over my head, that question. So, I'll try to address it if that's okay. So, in terms of trust, why do we speak about trust when we're dealing with blockchain? Because the technology itself, if structured right, promotes transparency. And there is a level of uh, decentralization, meaning that there is not one person that decides what to do with, say, a transaction. It's very difficult to break down, uh, like, simply, but... The te people say that the technology in, um, provides for trust because it's public most time, like the most successful ones are public. You can also have it private. So, But generally speaking, let's say when we think about Bitcoin and when we think about Ethereum, you're dealing with a transparent database, and someone is going to shoot me soon, but uh, a transparent database where you can see all of the transactions that are taking place in there. Um, the technology itself is neutral, so you know when people say, "Well, blockchain and crypto and NFT are a scam," they can be a scam. Like it depends how you use it. Uh, same as, as a knife can be used to cut bread or to kill someone. Shorter. I'm being told off. So <laughs> I'm not really sure. Like that, that's why you say the the, the technology um, can be can provide for trust because there there are. Um, verification processes. There is a consensus process that takes place, meaning that. Not one person, generally speaking, can approve or disapprove a transaction or change information on this database. So when you look at this database that is publicly available, you can see exactly what has happened, exactly what account holds what, and what account doesn't hold that. But then that said, you know, it can be used for like um, illicit purposes, uh, like anything. So. So what I think I've heard is that blockchain equals transparency. You, sh you should buy crypto. Correctly. Like that's the, I can say it, I can say it for two more days. Like buy crypto. It's okay. <laughs> let's, 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 there's only one question, and we got four of the panelists. But thank you, my friends. Thank you. No, no. <laughs> no, I think it, he answered it quite quite well. It was a very comprehensive answer. And folks, we did talk about how difficult it is to be a panellist at this stage in the game. So I really want you to embrace the fact that these are the hardcore. These are the ones that brave it where no one else would, where angels would fear to tread. So please give them a nice warm round of applause.